Thank you, Sarah, and thank all of you for coming out, and in particular to the college and the university. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's quite an honor to join you here tonight. Um, before we move into the conversation portion of the evening, I want to tell you just a little bit of the backstory of this book and how it came to be and why it came to be. Uh, and then I think I'll probably read just a couple bits of it as well to give you a sense of uh, some of the stories uh, that I tell and, and how I've tried to tell them. Um, so this, the backbone of this book is basically my memoir. Uh, that's the least reason that I wrote it. Uh, my memoir is basically a device to bring into the foreground a piece of the Hubble Space Tele Telescope history that's been overlooked in everything I've seen that's been written before. And uh, even more importantly, uh, the stories, the names, and the contributions of a small handful of engineers who are really the hidden figures of Hubble. They are the people that made the uh, absolutely essential but very obscure background and unsung contributions. But those, those are the contributions that are the reason Hubble is still operating today, coming up in April on its 30th anniversary in orbit. Not a small thing in its own right, 30 years operating in the harsh environment of outer space but the more so because the engineering commitment made when Hubble was uh, blessed by the Congress and put into development was that the telescope would last for 15 years. So we're coming up on twice its lifetime. That's all down to the ability to repair things that broke uh, as things go wrong in a spacecraft whizzing around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. More importantly though, the Hubble telescope that is up there about to turn 30 is not just the same one my crew and I put up in 1990, only the broken bits repaired. It's actually about a 1,000 times better telescope than the one that we put into orbit. Because the foresight in the engineering work of these people whose story that I wanted to tell is also the reason that all of the technology aboard Hubble, detectors, imaging sensors, gyroscopes, data recorders, you name it, solar arrays, all of those have been able to improve in performance and efficiency over the course of those 30 years. I'd like you to just think about how much more capable the cell phone you have in your pocket tonight is than the one you had in your pocket five years ago. And then multiply that kind of advance by six or 10 a factor at least. And that's the kind of thing that has been, abled, uh, been able to happen because of this capability to maintain and repair a telescope in orbit. So I knew this story in broad outline uh, when I was working on the Hubble project. I was assigned to it in 1985. The telescope was almost completely built, almost completely tested, and this vague promise had been made decades before that once you put it up there, astronauts will maintain it. So an architecture had been set that would make that promise a prospect. But the actual tools and equipment needed to deliver on that promise had really not hardly been begun yet. And that was the core of the work that I did with my crewmate, Bruce McCandless, and this unsung bunch of engineers from 1985 uh, to 1990. And we not only needed to think ahead to everything that could break on Hubble, for some of those, some of those boxes that had been foreordained, you know, we'll build this one so you can take it out easily and replace it. Others we sort of only just realized we have to add that to the list and be able to fix it as well. So there was both invent tools that could do the jobs that were originally promised and invent adaptations and modifications that would make virtually everything on Hubble repairable or replaceable. 300 miles above the Earth, going around at 17,500 miles an hour. All of you in your nice winter coats today, I want you to imagine double snowmobile suits three sets of gloves and a bucket on your head. And now, you know, go change the light bulb or replace spark plugs in your car. So uh, you don't go to a hardware store and just go down aisle five and find Hubble telescope tools. These were all inventions and innovative adaptations uh, to make that happen. Um, a final point is really about the reliability and, uh, you know, the, the idea of working on behalf of others. Uh, Bruce McCandless and I were the two spacewalkers that flew on the deployment flight. We almost ended up 
outside in our spacesuits fixing a part of Hubble before a workaround was found. But we were, to, we were also looking downstream. And we realized the likelihood that either of us would get assigned to one of those repair missions, it wasn't zero, but it also wasn't large. So we were not building a toolkit that we knew would work for us. We were definitely taking care to not build a toolkit tool that might work for someone my height, but not for someone this tall or that tall. Anybody from the astronaut corps needed to be able to get picked for that flight or the repair flights that would come. And everyone that ever went up to Hubble, we needed to give them 100% certainty that that wrench or that screwdriver or that clamp that you needed for right there on that task, guaranteed it will fit. Guaranteed it will work. Guaranteed you can reach it. It must never happen that you hear a radio call on a Hubble repair flight where a spacewalker says, hey guys, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. Um, so let me read uh, the prologue to this book just as a bit of a tone setter. Uh, there are lots of other of my favorite amusing stories I tell, but this is uh, not quite in the amusing vein, but very much in a highly memorable vein. April 24th, 1990, found us right back where we had been 14 days before. Suited up, strapped in, and ready to go, with the countdown clock stopped at T minus 31 seconds, again. This time, the Launch Control Center computers had halted the countdown because of an indication that a valve on one of the pipes used to fill the external fuel tanks had failed to close. If the indicator was correct, then just one valve was left to prevent the fuel in our tanks from leaking overboard instead of feeding into the shuttle's three main engines. If that happened, we could end up too low to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope, or at an abort landing site on the other side of the Atlantic, or splashed into the ocean. The launch would be scrubbed rather than accept that risk. If the indicator was wrong, however, think of the flaky tire pressure sensor on your car, then the engine system was fine and there was no reason to scrub. So which was it? Serious problem or faulty indicator? Go for launch or scrub for the day? This high stakes call fell to the launch team controller responsible for the space shuttle's three main, main propulsion system. Someone I still know only by the call sign MPS. Time was not on his side. The shuttle's auxiliary power units set a strict limit on how much longer we could hold at this point. Just 12 minutes more. In the cockpit, we listened intently as the launch team worked out the problem. MPS, what's your status? The launch director asked. The propulsion engineer talked calmly through the data on his display. The temperature and pressure readings in the surrounding lines were not consistent with an open valve. Fundamental physics said it had to be closed. He proposed to send a manual command, hoping this would make the valve indicator read correctly. That worked. But the control center computers still had a lock on the countdown clock. MPS, what's your call? The launch director pressed. I'm prepared to manually override the software and proceed with the count, he replied. With a crisp and rapid cadence the best soldier would envy, the launch director gave him a go to do that and told the other controllers to prepare to resume the countdown. The call we had been hoping for came a split second after. All controllers, this is NTD. The countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. The entire episode had taken less than three minutes. 31 seconds later, Discovery roared off the launch pad. Sitting on the lower deck with nothing but a wall of storage lockers to look at, I closed my eyes and took in the sounds and sensations of a space shuttle launch. The solid rocket motors, which are essentially gigantic firecrackers, made the first two minutes and 15 seconds turbulent and loud. I felt like I was in an earthquake and riding a fighter jet at the same time. The vibrations were almost bone rattling 
the thrust pushing through my back, strong and constant. I felt the thrust tailing off just before Charlie announced the solid rockets were burning out, then heard the thump that confirmed they had been jettisoned. The ride was much quieter now and as smooth as an electric train. The push against my back continued as the main engines accelerated us towards orbital velocity. Six minutes later, they cut off as planned. The lightness in my arms and legs and the checklists floating at the ends of their tethers announced that we were in orbit. Though nearly six years had passed since my first space flight, I felt instantly at home. Thank you so much for joining us here today and for your remarks at the start. I wanted to begin by what's probably going to sound like a very naive question, but the first time you went into space, what was that like? Uh, well, the countdown was very much like what I described yeah. there and the launch very similar, except it was all so much newer, I was barely paying attention to it. It was really a bit of sensory overload for all eight and a half minutes of the engine burn. Um, it's something you've been working for and looking forward to for so long. All of your practice sessions, though, have not gone smoothly. The point of the simulations is not to show you how easy a ride it might be on launch day. The point of your simulations is to you know, throw a lot of banana peels under your feet and challenge you to keep things moving in the right direction, solve problems truly on the fly, uh, in the, you know, not make mistakes in doing that. So I was on my first flight so accustomed to everything in the universe going wrong during liftoff that I could barely take my eyes off the instrument panels waiting to see the, the wrong needle flicker in the wrong way and signal that we were having to solve another problem again. Happily, it was a very smooth and easy launch and I was finally able to relax a little bit and start to take in the reality of being in space. And when you came back to Earth, what did you have sort of a different perspective on, um, you on know, being I, back on the ground? I, I think the, uh, for me anyway, I think the biggest change in perspective from before I flew in space to after I came home the first time was more about the, the process of learning and growth and your own development that it takes to get to the flight and conduct the flight. Uh, that might have a little bit to do with my having been an earth scientist and a, a map crazed girl from as young as I can remember because the, the earth was to me not some bizarre sight I had never thought of seeing from that vantage point. I'd absorbed pictures from space that every other astronaut had ever taken. I'd studied maps intensely from a very young age. So for me, it was like seeing a, a long, an old friend from a different vantage point, not some sudden shock of, my goodness, that's what the Earth looks like. But you, you really, I think it's true of any grand undertaking that is bigger than you, that you make yourself a part of, uh, that will change you in countless ways. And who you will be at the end of that adventure is going to be very different than who you were at the start. You mentioned that this is something that you've been interested in since you were a, a little girl. When, when did that turn from just a childhood dream to a reality? When was the moment that you realized that you were going to go to space? Yeah, yeah, I actually never dreamt as a child of being an astronaut. Uh, I was drawn more broadly to the kind of uh, curiosity and uh, cleverness of figuring out how to do things for the first time and sort of the adventurousness of uh, of the life and the career and the expeditions that I saw astronauts do. Uh, I didn't put a label on it. Oh, that means I want that job. Uh, and the fact that I, everyone I was watching doing that was male, not female, that, that did not bother me. It wasn't a deterrence. People, there are people that have lives of this kind of curiosity and passion and adventure. And I would like that kind of curiosity and passion and adventure in my life. And that became just a broad driving force that you didn't have a label for years, did not have a label or a destination on it. But it, it certainly guided me as I tried to think of to topics to take in school, subjects to take in school that might be my keys to the pathway that would get me that kind of curiosity and adventurousness and, and passion. You've also talked a bit about the preparation, a lot of preparation that you had to do before going into space. Can you tell us a bit about what you had to do and what that was like? Well, uh, you really starts with mastering a mastery level of knowledge of all of the space shuttles, technical systems, and how they work. 
but you know, again, not just sort of a textbook level of can you remember it all? You know, can you write down all the bits and parts? Can you trace the, all the circuits out? But more a, a really practical and hands-on level of understanding of that. And that's where those simulations come in. So to live in a very accurately uh, set up high fidelity simulator of a spatial cockpit to live and work there for say a 12 hour stint with the sequence of steps and activities that you're intended to do on some 12 hour piece of your flight and be you know, trying to work through and get that done while your devious nefarious instructors insert a computer command here that kills an electrical circuit or blocks up some mechanism. And that challenges you to really dig beyond it's supposed to work this way into, well, what other pathways can I have, do I have to get that done? Uh, what other ways can I adapt? Can I adapt the plan or can I fix the thing that just went wrong? And how, how cleverly can I do that? And you start those simulations with really on your own in pretty simple um, system by system simulations. You move upward over time to working with your entire crew. So you're starting now to learn how to work off each other's skills and strengths and off the different roles that each of you have within the crew. And then at the final stage, as you're in, say, the final six months before a flight, it's your crew that will be in the spaceship and the entire mission control crew that are your, they are your additional eyes and ears. They have many more uh, readouts on their consoles on the ground of the status of the space shuttle. You can see many more dials and gauges and measurement points than the ones you can fit on the computer screens or instrument panels on the spaceship. So astronauts can get this glimpse of what's happening with the space shuttle and the controllers can see much more. And they can take more time to think things through or to do analyses. You have to keep up with all the events that are happening at 17,500 miles an hour. So learning, you know, how do you make those different layers of, uh, of competency, of data insight, of time flexibility? How do you take advantage of all those different dimensions that the entire team, astronauts plus ground team together have? Um, that's about building your own situational awareness, uh, the ground folks building an awareness of what the crew are seeing and doing, and all of you building a really high level of, of both very efficient and exceedingly accurate communications. You mentioned earlier as well that when you were a girl, all the astronauts that you would see would be men, and you were the first American woman to walk in space. Where do you think the industry is at currently in terms of inclusion and um, <clears throat> diversity, and what steps do you think still have to be taken to make it more? Yeah, I, you know, I think in the in the astronaut corps within the United States astronaut corps, um, it, it's improving. Could always have wished it would have moved along more quickly than it has done. Uh, but we've, we've had uh, women command space shuttle flights, we've had women command the space station. Uh, women have been the flight directors who command mission control uh, and technically have the overall responsibility for the total mission. Uh, had a woman, a, a re, uh, retired astronaut, Ellen Ochoa, uh, lead the Johnson Space Center, uh, be the number two at NASA. So you know, it's moving along senior women in the engineering disciplines and the medical disciplines. The numbers remain small. The pipeline to follow behind the women who are in those posts now is, is not as full as I would like it to be. Uh, the technical, skilled technical pipeline in the United States is not as full of, of anybody as I would like it to be, but still in particular women and people of color uh, are very underrepresented. And that means, you know, that there's an equality and equity version or dimension to what that means for the country, but there's also a direct cost to NASA. That means there's a tremendous array of talent that the agency is not managing to access. Talented, capable, creative people just happen to come in a slightly different shape or color than the standard ones. And for various reasons, we're not bringing into the scientific and technical fields and not therefore not getting into the space profession. How would you encourage, what would you say to someone who you're trying to encourage to get into the space profession? You know, it's, um, the scientific and technical fields can, they can certainly be demanding. Uh, it takes, you know, intensity to, of effort to master anything, whether that's drama or the piano or engineering or, or math. Um, I, I wish I had the magic button to turn on in other people and young people in particular the kind of you know, delight in learning and, and curiosity about how the world works or how cool it is to make things work, how cool it is to be 
the inventor or the innovator, not just the consumer. Uh, one of my biggest points of dismay is sometimes speaking to school age audiences and trying to talk about this. You know, you could be the kid, you could be the people that go to Mars, or you might be the one who designs the spaceship or builds the rocket. And you, so many of them are sort of bored, lying on the side of their hands. And it, the crushing question I've gotten a couple of times basically has been, oh, that sounds hard. Can't I just buy it? So this, you know, this sort of sense of identity as predominantly a consumer, a purchaser of something somebody else created, somebody else imagined, somebody else made happen. I mean, you, you can pick up this book and say, oh gosh, this is gonna be a horribly dry book about engineering. People, this, this is a story of people who imagined an extraordinary thing before it, anything similar had ever been done. They began imagining it before anything had ever been put into space, period. The imaginings of Hubble begin six years, almost 10 years before Sputnik. So that, but that's what engineers and scientists do. They imagine possibilities and capabilities that don't exist yet, that can be hugely powerful for garnering new knowledge, for saving lives, for improving the daily lives of people. And they don't just then imagine it, they master the means of turning it into realities and bringing it to our lives. So in the, the life we live today is, is the future those people were creating starting decades ago. I think what I keep wanting to rouse in people is, what are we giving, what are we passing on to generations to come? Because these things all need renewal and different challenges crop up in life and technology that need new solutions, new ideas. Someone should be imagining them today. Someone should be turning them into real devices, real equipment, real methods, real companies. Uh, we're, that is such an incredibly cool thing to be able to do, and it's way more fun than just buying it. Following on from that, what, what do you see as the biggest areas for new space exploration going into the next decade and few decades? Um, I think the biggest, I think the one that will return the greatest array of dividends and new capabilities for life on Earth is the challenge of uh, extending human life in a longer duration fashion beyond low Earth orbit. Um, my own preference would be that the goal in that challenge should be on Mars, not because, well, it's a little bit because I'm a geologist and I, who doesn't want to see the volcanoes of Mars, uh, but the main reason is that's in a vastly harder goal than uh, making a sustained human presence on the moon. And it's my belief, and I think space technology history demonstrates that this is a wise belief, that the range of scientific and technical advances that would have to be made to get people to Mars, sustain them there for any reasonable period of time and bring them back uh, home, the array of advances you would have to make and the scale of advance you would have to make are unlike, there's no other trigger, there's no other forcing function that would challenge that broadly and that deeply. And from all of that, you know, other innovators looking for improvements to life on Earth would spot you know, the new insight about uh, radiation effects on the human body, the new insight about power storage, the new capability in robotic control. They would spot those and percolate them back into all, all imaginable forms and, and avenues of our life here today. You know, Paul, Apollo is famous for boot, boot prints on the moon, and many people sort of derided as a foolish race, you know, sort of raced to the street corner, said, ha-ha, I got here, came home and gave up. But Apollo, the challenge of put people, put men on the moon and bring them home, this time frame, that challenge was so demanding. Apollo marks the time when people stopped bragging about how large their computers were and began to brag about how small they were because no other forcing function of that era required this amount of computing power with that amount of reliability in that small a package. And it was not done to create cell phones for all of us, but that started the cascade of innovations and advances that have miniaturized computers to the point that they're in our refrigerators, in our cars, in our pockets on an everyday basis. With climate change causing so much upheaval across the earth, do you see a permanent future in space? I, in particular, I, I'm not a fan of the lifeboat theory of since we've screwed up this planet so well, mm -hmm. let some of us just escape to another outpost somewhere. That's sort of the ultimate gated community, right? Several of us lucky bunch are gonna move over here and 
the rest of you have fun. Sorry, sorry for all the trash we left behind. See you later. Um, but I am a fan uh, and think it's very critical that we have a sustained presence of advanced instrumentation in orbit, helping take the pulse of this planet, not just, not just visually monitoring for visible changes, but actually making the measurements of the ocean, of uh, terrestrial land cover, of the land surfaces, of the atmosphere itself, that will continue to give us the ability to predict, to forecast what conditions will be you know, years or decades into the future. So we have some, some runway to plan, to consider adaptations, to consider modifications that may make society more resilient, human life more resilient, all life more resilient on this planet. It's not just about us. And my final question before we open this up to the audience is your trip to the UK coincides with the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. Can you reflect a bit on how far space exploration has come over these 30 years? Well, Hubble was, uh, Hubble was first conceived as the one and only large space observatory, but uh, by the time I began working on it, it was seen as the first of a series of five advanced space observatories in the infrared, the gamma ray, and the X-ray portions of the spectrum. And, and all of those missions happened. And, and across that whole range of the spectrum, each of those telescopes in its way uh, revealed new phenomena to us, showed us new processes in star formation and galactic formation, uh, told us, changed our concept of black holes completely, and gave us a far more precise understanding of the age of the universe and the rate of expansion of the universe, and, and even started the sequence of finding planets around other stars outside our solar system. Uh, that list of exoplanets, as they're called, is now up to something like 4,000. Uh, and with more and more precision, helping us identify very plausibly Earth-like planets in, in other star systems. So it's, you know, what we know about our place in the cosmos and how our cosmos works is wildly different uh, than when we began working on Hubble in 1985. Over a similar time span, what we know, thanks to space-based perspectives of how this planet works, is, is radically different than it was just a couple of decades ago. And slowly, our technical capability to sustain uh, people in orbit and move beyond orbit has also begun to move forward, along with the knowledge of how the human body and, and human beings fare with that long exposure in outer space. So it's, it's been a tr really quite tremendous advance uh, across a very wide front over the next, the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. And I can't wait to see what happens over the next 30. Someone's gonna make boot prints on Mars. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we'll move to questions from the audience now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone to come to you, and please stand up while asking your question. Could we start with the member just yeah, next to you on the first row? Hi, thank you so much for your speech um, and the conversation with, the, oh, with our panelists. Um, I'm wondering how, um, when, you, when you spoke of the confining mentality of the, uh, the confining consumer mentality among the young generation, how would you um, improve the education system if you were a policymaker? Um, I draw a distinction between education and schooling. Uh, schooling is a very didactic, you know, sort of turn your head over, I'm gonna pour some new information in your ear and then turn your head back up and see if you can spit it back out. That's not really deep and genuine learning. Um, I mean, ba human babies come out as natural scientists. They're observing, they're assessing, they're adapting and responding to that environment, and they're scaffolding forward new knowledge that they really deeply retain and use in the next application. Schooling squashes out sort of all of that behavior, I think, in the interest of external appearance of some discipline and control in the classroom. So I would reinstall play into early childhood classrooms. I would probably ban digital devices in school classrooms up to about age five or six. It is the active, hands-on, uh, iterative engagement with fresh stimuli, thinking and, and processing that, re-expressing that, whether it's in a story to your parents or in a drawing uh, on a piece of paper. That's what really embeds knowledge, and that's what also feeds a curiosity and uh, I think feeds that passion, that delight that comes, there's a delight in learning, there's a delight in the discovery of something new you didn't know. You see that in, in infants and young children. 
we really managed to squash it out of kids pretty quickly in the schooling system and turn it into a didactic process. So that's, I think, a key thing. If, if you grew up knowing how delightful it is to discover and try something new and succeed at it, that'll become a spring force, a motive force inside you that usually you have a hard time reining in. And that's what I want, is it's hard to rein that in. There's a lot of it there. Here we go to the member in the third round. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, my question is, when you first went to space, um, there was a very strong sentiment about uh, astronauts being heroes, and it was a part of like American national identity and belonging, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and since then, I feel as if there's been more of a reliance on like private sector development, et cetera. My question is, do you think that in order for the US to be a space leader, we need a strong NASA and a strong government interest in space development, or can we rely on companies like SpaceX and other external places to just keep that renewed interest? Um, I, think, I think very much the former. Uh, I, but I think it's both and. It's, it's not pick one or the other. Um, but the role of NASA, as you've seen in the past in, aer in the space sector, and you still see today in commercial aviation, despite the scale and profitability of commercial airliners, is NASA's not trying to be an airline in the airline space, but it, but it is doing the advanced development and the problem solving that um, low margin commercial airlines are not going to be able to invest in. Uh, so the higher efficiency gas turbines you see on jet engines today all root in NASA advances in funda very fundamental things. You need advanced ceramics to make you know, turbine blades and turbine cores that can withstand higher core temperatures in the jet. American Airlines is not inventing that stuff. They're not doing that research. In fact, every time the Congress has tried to squash that part, or, or a White House administration has tried to squash that part of NASA, it has been the airline captains of industry rushing to the Congress saying, you know, don't you dare. They're doing you know, the farming, the seed planting, and the cultivating that's giving us the advances that we can take in to improve efficiency and operations in the airline. So it's, it's that kind of partnership that I think is beginning to emerge in the space sector. Um, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, uh, Boeing, all those guys, none of them have created anything new. They are using the rocket technology, they're using largely the manufacturing methods, they're using largely the operational methods that NASA has proven and developed the reliability in over decades. So they're standing on very high shoulders. Jeff Bezos is much better at acknowledging that than Elon Musk. Um, uh, none of them have transformed the rocket um, equation or uh, chemical rocket propulsion, the energetics involved. So they're building on a base that public investment built starting back when there was no, not even faintly, the notion that there could be commercial uh, ability to capitalize on that. There may be a genuine commercial market in what Bezos and Musk are doing right now. I'm actually on the skeptical side. I, I think what we may see the old model was NASA owns the rocket and hired private companies to operate the rocket, prepare it for launch, launch it, run mission control. It was actually all private sector people following NASA instruction. The new model is Elon Musk owns the rocket and he's hired the people that are going to operate it. And this really only becomes commercial if there are lots more users besides government that want to get to low Earth orbit. If that part of the proposition falls through, then you've just taken this government customer and handed it to a different contractor. But it'll be very much similar, con and in the end, it'll be similar contract and really non-economic terms. So if there are you know, 50 multimillionaires that want to have a tourist ride in space per year, Elon can launch 20 or 30 rockets, take six of them each, it'll be a nice niche adventure business. It may be profit, he may be able to make it profitable for a long time. It's never going to revolutionize anything. But if there are hundreds of millions of people or tens of millions of people that want to vacation in orbit or take cargo to orbit, that could start to change the economics. I think that's, that is something between many decades off or a fantasy, in my view. We go to the member. 
Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, this question might, be, might sound funny, but uh, you know, some astronauts mentioned once they went to the you know, space, they feel some kind of spiritual thing, although this is a, what I say is a success of the great science which humans develop. Did you feel, have you, feel, have you felt some kind of spiritual thing, or if not, why not? Or if so, or if, if, even if you don't feel something special, uh, do you have any fundamental difference before going and, you know, before going after coming back to the Earth? Um, my sense from both my own experience and, and watching and talking with crew members who I knew fairly well is I, I think it, it amplifies or confirms um, your approach to life or your viewpoints to the, to the divine or the spiritual that you already have. So my crewmates and colleagues who are very devout, uh, practicing religious people, it absolutely confirms to them, you know, clearly that I'm seeing the hand of God in clearer and more majestic form. People who are, I would say, more spiritual, but not necessarily of a denomination or a practicing ideology, it, it to them is a, sort of a more general, there's clearly, you know, we, we are clearly not the be all and end all of creation. We are clearly part of something so much bigger than us. Uh, my own view about you know, what is the transformative element here? Is it that you, is it you got to space? Is it that you looked out the window? What is it that, is there something genuinely transformative there? And if it is, what is it? Um, I don't believe that physically moving 200 miles in any dimension is transformative. So you know, whether that's here to Manchester or here to there is sort of, it. but you know, the, the journey, the, the, the developmental process that any human being goes through to undertake um, something as, as both grand and aspirational, majestic, but also demanding as a space flight, I think that process certainly transforms you. Um, you, it builds character in a different way. It's the technical mastery aside, it builds character in a different way. It connects you with a group of people in a, a very potent and different way. And so I, I think when, I think I, I think I was different when I came back, but I think it's because of the journey that I went through to be there, not just because I looked out the window. Should we go to the member in the front row? Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was wondering, so there used to be a great deal of competition between nations. So similarly to the question about private versus government funded efforts to go to space, do you think this is a scientific endeavor, it's inherently collaborative, so this should be something where we join forces um, to go to space or um, do scientific experiments? Or do you think there's a healthy element of competition when different nations try to tackle a certain question first? Yeah, I, I think the dynamic is, mul is multi-layered and is, in my view, actually not very different than what it was in the Cold War. So the spacefaring nations, almost two to one, have uh, a scientific, an overt and scientific uh, level and, and pan plan of engagement. NASA is the embodiment of that in the United States, you know, ESA in, in the European Union. But uh, at the national level, almost all also have some military space capability and certain military reliance, whether that's surveillance, you know, surveillance and reconnaissance satellites, communication satellites, or, or you know, other devices such as that. Um, the, the that's, let me call that the national sovereignty plane. The national sovereignty plane is very much still a, a sovereign, sovereign protection dynamic. And uh, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of sort of subtle below the scale of war adversarial testing and jousting on that level um, that happens all the time. It's been happening a long time be between the first three spacefaring nations and it's broadening out. Um, I, it's a fairly conscious play or strategy on the part of most of the spacefaring nations to maintain a, a healthy collaboration with other spacefaring partners as a bit of a counter. So it's a, it's a scientific diplomacy counter to the, the inevitable tensions of sovereign interests in outer space. But uh, in the US space policy circles, and I think pretty well in the global circles these days, um, the triad everyone's talking about is that the future of space is more congested, contested, and commercial. Thank you. Could we go to the member in the first row of the back? 
Hi, thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, so my question is actually, well, I guess it's two parts, but um, so how long were your trips to space when you went and what was the physical effect that you felt on your body when you came back from them? Um, so I flew on three missions, 1984, 1990, 1992. They were, um, get this right, seven, five, and 10 days in duration. Uh, those, those are too short. Those intervals are too short to have any really lasting effect. In the immediate few hours that you come home, uh, you, your limbs will feel heavy. You've never you've really, you have really never thought about the weight of your limbs. But when you've like never felt the weight of your limbs for 10 days, you suddenly feel like they're made of wet concrete or something. It's noticeable that this thing is heavy to lift up. Um, the other very noticeable thing is uh, regaining your balance because the mechanisms are our brain makes sense of our and maintains our balance here through a combination of the signals from our eyes and from the semicircular canals in our inner ears. This mechanism drops out when you're in weightlessness and the brain adapts pretty quickly to going only on what your sight sees. And of course, you don't really have to balance at all because there's no such thing as falling over in zero gravity. Uh, but as soon as you get back into a gravitational field, this guy starts up again and you can it's kind of amusing, actually, to sort of monitor your brain beginning to figure out that this thing is, is back in gear again. If you, if you know an astronaut pretty well and you watch them, uh, you used to be able to see this more with the shuttle because we would walk off the shuttle. The long duration crews coming home and landing in the Russian steps are carried out of the capsules, um, more for safety than anything else. But you could see shuttle astronauts now and then walking like they were just ever so slightly drunk. If you turned your head, as you walked that way, if you turned your head that way, you'd feel like you were tipping and you'd see your foot sort of throw out just to be sure I didn't quite fall over. And it followed quickly by an embarrassed, you know, I didn't do that. Could we go to the member um, in the first row over there? Thanks. Um, you talked about space being more congested. Do you think um, anything needs to be done to prevent too many satellites being launched um, that sort of thing, so that space junk doesn't become an issue. Yeah, uh, sp space debris is already uh, quite a concern. Uh, the last numbers I recall, uh, the global groups that collaborate to track things in space had a track of about something close to 20,000 objects, which would mean objects sort of this, about this large or greater. Um, but then statistically, if you do the projections, there are undoubtedly millions, if not tens of millions, of much smaller particles, say down to the size of a poppy seed, let's say. If you get hit by something the size of a poppy seed that's going 17,500 miles an hour, you're going to, it's, it'll have the impact on you of being hit by a 90 mile an hour baseball pitch. So the, the energy, energetics are very, very high. Um, and there's really nothing can be done, nothing anyone's come up with at any rate yet can be done about all those little poppy seeds and plums that are running around waiting to crash into something. They're in all sorts of variegated orbits. Uh, if you want to catch that poppy seed, you've got to have something that can resist catching a bunch of 90 mile an hour baseballs. None of it's magnetic, so you know, clever magnetic swooping approaches don't work. Uh, so the, the reliance is really on statistics. Uh, along your orbital path, you know, project a, a thin cross section, not a fat cross section. Uh, forward shielding of what would be the impact uh, faces. But the new dimension to this that's coming up is uh, these several, at least half dozen commercial entities that are proposing uh, mega constellations of relatively small satellites, say about yay big roughly, uh, to provide ubiquitous internet across all portions of the world. Uh, Elon Musk alone, his company has already put 120, I think it is, might be 180 now. He's already put that sort of number into orbit. He's got a license to put 40,000. And there's at least five other companies that have licenses to put you know, 5,000 to 10,000. So you know, one man's super cool small communication satellites, another man's debris. And if, if they all form in this shell that they're planning on because of the geometry, you could just about start to make a shell that it's too risky to launch anything else through. The trick right now is there are intergovernmental uh, ground rules about putting satellites into space and coordinating orbits that governments have accepted. Uh, they, will, they will make binding on their government agencies, but it's 
it's a blank sheet of paper about what are the ground rules for private companies and who adjudicates those ground rules. So it's wild open west at the moment. If we go to the member on the first row over there. We've got one over this side as well. Yeah, oh, okay. Hello. Um, what do you think about commercializing space? Because there was talk, I don't really follow it. I didn't manage to follow it afterwards, but there was talk of like, Virgin Airways kind of sending up jets into space and everything. What are your views on that? Um, Richard Branson is bound and determined and very public about intending to have him and his family hop on their, uh, what do they call it, Spaceship Two, uh, and take a suborbital flight. So Virgin Galactic is talking about suborbital flights. It'll be sort of a big pole vault, so probably maybe 10 or 15 minutes of zero gravity at the top and a really dramatic ride up and down. Um, Blue Origins also talking about uh, possible tourist flights, SpaceX is as well. Um, I, again, I think the suborbital, you know, the you know, space, astronaut dream camp, right? Give you a great experience for about a week and one day you'll have this magic ride. Um, have at it, great, good fun. Um, that's gonna be in round numbers, probably $250,000 a ticket. Um, there's probably a great enough number of people with a sense of adventure and a checkbook large enough to do that to keep one or two of those businesses going as an adventure niche for a fair amount of time. Happy, no problem, I have no problem seeing that. I think the question of is, is commercial transport to and from Earth orbit or beyond really going to happen? I'd come back to our earlier discussion. I think, I doubt that there is a genuinely commercial demand function of any meaningful scale for that. So I, I think what it's really gonna be is a contractor substitution and and for a very long time to come, still a, a public interest, a, a government interest um, demand model. We go to the member in the third row, in the middle of the third row. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so what do you think are some of the biggest threats coming from space um, right now in the, in the well, this year and in the next few years, do you see any big threat that can be like a really big issue? Um, in certain quarters, there's quite an interest on what goes under the heading of planetary protection, which is uh, you know astronomical detection of asteroids and other bodies that might cl come close to the Earth. Uh, you know, think back to the extinction of dinosaurs kind of crater, uh, and there are some small groups that are trying to figure out if if you could detect an, an asteroid far enough out, if you could get its, its orbital parameters accurate enough with high enough certainty that you knew it was going to be a physical threat to the Earth, uh, then what would you do about that? And in, in general, the notions tend to be try to intercept it very far out away from the Earth and in one way or another, uh, give it just enough of a nudge. And if you're you know, very far out from Earth, a little nudge would send it, you know, increase the mist distance considerably. Uh, the trick in those things is we, we still don't really know all that well what these extraterrestrial bodies are made of. So that's another line of inquiry that people are now working on and countries are sending asteroid lander and asteroid retrieval missions to get a little more of a grip on that because you, what you would not want to do is spot an asteroid the size of this building that's, you know, let's say, hundreds of millions of miles away from Earth, succeed at getting a spacecraft out there to try to deflect it, and find out that it sort of looked solid to you, but is actually kind of a cloud of particles, and as soon as you push it, you don't have an object the size of this building, you have 50 objects, smaller, but now all in slightly different trajectories, so you've actually increased your risk profile, not, not made it better. Can we go to the member in the second row, at the end of the second row? Thank you for coming tonight. And my question is, regarding the gender equality scene and its openness to progress within these last few years, what is your perception um, regarding the future of women leadership in the spatial industry? Thank you. Uh, leadership in the aerospace industry? Um, it, you know, the leaders of the main companies are st now an interesting bunch. There are some like Elon Musk, uh, that have some, I would say, really solid 
engineering technical background. Gwen Shotwell, the woman who runs SpaceX, is, is an engineer. Um, but on the larger aerospace companies, those leadership positions have more and more become you know, the, the MBA business leaders. And all of the larger companies, of course, have multi -lines of business, multiple lines of business. So it makes a fair degree of sense that the chairman on top of all of that has sort of a broad business acumen. Uh, but you know, I can't help but look back at the earlier era of Apollo and of NASA, where I think some, some of the reason, part of the reason NASA was able to move with the speed it did uh, and with the political reliability and assurance it did was because the highest levels of the agency were highly skilled technical engineers. So when a tough question came up, uh, it, many of those tough questions did not have to go through 13 layers of review before they finally got to someone who could say yes. Uh, and the people at the top of the pyramid knew how to quickly assess decisions made beneath them without requiring, you know, brief it up to the next guy and then the next guy and then the next guy and the next guy and I'll eventually take a look at it. That sort of pancaking of how many people get to review something before someone all of the people who review something can say no. Only this person up here can say yes. So you have way too many reviewers compared to the number of doers. And you have way too many potential no's. And all the incentive is to say no, lest you missed something. I don't want to be the person who reviewed and said yes, and then it goes bad. So you've got a lot of incentive in the review stack to be cautious, to say no, to say check something again and come back, and virtually no reward or real incentive uh, to say yes, and not enough delegated authority far enough down to speed up some of the decision making. This is you know, what innovation have the Elon Musks of the world made. They've been able to line up their own system and lay in their administrative ground rules to counter some of that problem. Uh, they're not really going to be allowed to take a different risk posture that NASA, the insurance companies won't let them, and the liability lawyers won't let them. So they're, they're crafting a different pathway, a, a leaner pathway to reach that same reliability. And they're going to need a couple more years of proving successful flights that prove that they've set all those pathways up correctly. Uh, and big mistakes will set them back and start to impose some of the extra burdens that NASA has. So I would like to see more technical leadership vertically distributed both through NASA and through the companies. And I'd like to see a rethink of where we assign the responsibility and the authority for making key decisions. Could we go to the member at the end of the row over there? <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. This is more of a medical biological question. I hope that's oh, okay. Oh, to a geologist, be kind. <laughs> Do we know what happens to the human reproductive system when astronauts come back to Earth? And that's the male and female reproductive system. And do you think that affects astronauts' decisions, talking about getting more people, diverse people involved in NASA? Does that def affect their decisions to apply when NASA puts out a call for applications? I'm with the caveat that I'm not deeply conversant with that, the medical literature on that, uh, I, but I'm not aware of any uh, notable or uh, sustained enduring effect to either male or female reproductive systems. Uh, and certainly from our class forward is the first era of spaceflight that we've seen, uh, well, not quite right, it's the first era of spaceflight that we've seen women fly in space both before and after they bear children. Certainly, track record of, of male of men parenting children before or after spaceflight. So I don't I don't know of anything that's ever been uh, discovered uh, in either the individuals flying or their progeny that's been uh, any kind of an issue or concern. Thank you. I, w I would just add, by the way, uh, just as an added point, um, NASA again. It, this applies only to NASA. Uh, any any astronaut who's flown with NASA of course is screened very carefully, very intensively each year medically. But after you retire from flying and even after you retire and leave the agency, NASA invites and will bring you back to Houston for an intense physical each year. And that is to keep track of your health over time so that if 
if there is, say, a subtle effect, you know, women who fly in space for up to two weeks, we see no change in any reproductive health issues through the remainder of their life, but gee, women who've been six months or longer, we start to see in their 50s or 60s something emerge that looks statistically not what you would expect for a healthy population and a spaceflight population. They want to accumulate those longitudinal databases, and the only way to do that is to maintain longitudinal studies of people with different lengths of exposure to space from my comparatively short ones to, say, um, Christina Cook's or um, Peggy Whitson's substantially longer ones. So those longitudinal studies are underway, but they're obviously in very early stages. Can we go to the member in the third, at the end of the third row? Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you about your time in the Navy, actually, and how you felt that interplayed with your skills as a scientist, because at least in this country, it's comparatively unusual to find a scientist with military experience or indeed someone with a scientific background in the military and whether, whether there was a reason that you made the choice of, of the Navy or the military and how you felt that helped you perhaps in, in the rest of your career. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I, I, think it, I think that philosophy is a rather different in the US Armed Forces. And I would, I would say particularly, uh, to, uh, to a degree in all of them, but I would say particularly in the Air Force and the Navy. Uh, and in the Navy specifically, uh, post-World, well, the American experience of World War II uh, persuaded policymakers at both the civilian and military side that it was valuable and important to have science and technical expertise both working in the, on the research needed to support and sustain effective armed forces and within the armed forces. So the Office of Naval Research, for example, grew right out of the World War II effort and picked up things like gravity measurements and seismic measurements, understanding the ocean, um, sound in the sea, the propagation of sound in the sea, sonar, and so forth. Um, that began, that developed over time, but slowly into a distinct specialty community of uniformed officers within our Navy that are oceanographic specialists. Uh, and that encompasses meteorology, everything atmospheric, everything water column, oceanic, and seafloor. Uh, and uh, continue work by the Office of Naval Research, which is civilian with military officers rotating through, and the Naval Research Laboratory, which is civilian with officers rotating through. Uh, I went for and applied for a commission directly into the reserve, the part-time component of that Navy Oceanography Corps in the late 1980s. Uh, and I did that because I was, I was looking for a way to stay more conversant with the ocean sciences. That was the field of my PhD. Uh, and it's hard to do that while you're immersed in the busyness uh, of being an astronaut. But the astronaut office had a sort of clear mental carve out for people who had uh, formal military commitments two weeks a year and a weekend a month to some reserve component of the armed forces. So that was a way I could stay current with that. And secondly, you know, being an astronaut is the world's coolest ops job. Uh, but I realized I was at some point probably not going to still be an astronaut and the Navy uh, obligation would be a way to stay involved with very cool operational things. So that, those were the factors that led me to seek that commission. We have time for one final question. Could we go to the member in the first row? Thanks. I was just going to say, what's your favorite movie to do with space travel and why? Uh, um, my favorite movie for just plain old good laughs is Space Cowboys. Uh, and it's not only all the reasons you just laughed for, but if you know the older days astronauts, you can kind of say, well, he's playing him and he's playing him. So that's very fun. Um, I guess other, my uh, all around favorite movie otherwise, I would have to say is Apollo 13. Um, it, it held very close to the true story. There's little bits of artistic license. Um, you know, a movie can make you become entranced with maybe six or eight people. And there are obviously way more than six or eight characters that played pivotal roles in that some of whom are not happy that they were not one of the named characters in the movie. Um, but uh, you know, that really captured well the, the ethos and the expertise uh, that I'm proud to have been a part of and I'm proud to have brought to the astronaut corps. I think I, I 
I probably saw it about six times because all my friends would say, I'm going to go see it and I need you with me. <laughs> uh, and my favorite one was I went to see it with a, a Navy friend who was a, rose to the rank of four star admiral. He was a attack boat submarine skipper, and they're the sort of really hard edged, hardcore guys in our Navy. Uh, and the film starts up, the first dramatic moment happens, and he is like this, leaning out on his knees. He never moves the whole movie, and he's just sort of wrapped. And it ends, and the credits go, and he's still just sitting like this. And he just looks down the row at me, and I said, yeah, those are my guys. <laughs> I liked that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but we are having a book sale and the signing of Handprints on Hubble in the Goodman Library now. So if you all want to head over there after we leave, um, we will see you there. But please join me in thanking Kathy for coming to the meeting.